Okay, so while the panelists are settling down, I'd like to uh, very briefly introduce the uh, general gist of the panel. So we uh, uh, heard a lot from Curdy, a, a wish list for, for what we are supposed or expected to, to cover. I, I think that, as was mentioned earlier, um, uh, many of us have been in this field for, for quite some time and uh, have, have taken an active interest in these debates. And one of the things uh, that might have changed a little bit in these recent years in the debate is a bigger emphasis on bigger picture questions. Sure. On the, on the, uh, uh, there's always been obviously competition and standards, competition over who gets to de develop the standards, who gets to decide what you get into the standards. But there's more of a, a notion that in, in addition to this traditional competition between companies, there's a competition between countries, between economic systems, between different approaches to developing standards. Um, governments in different regions of the world are uh, more or less explicitly uh, taking more sort of roles, uh, developing strategies, uh, how to position their country positions in that global competition. And in the US, which traditionally uh, has uh, valued a more uh, um, hands-off role for government in that space, there are at least studies being produced and uh, government agencies being asked or asking private entities to produce reports on whether there's something to be done about this notion that the US needs to, uh, needs to remain a leader in the development of internationalism. And that obviously ties to these important policy debates that we had about how should standards organizations be run? How should the government interact with the private actors in the standard development space? And it might also tie to these debates that many of us here in the room uh, mostly focus on, which is uh, what are the rules for the intellectual property that is then being included into these standards? How these how this intellectual property is being licensed and valued? And is there any inter intersection between these bigger picture debates that are increasingly gaining traction and these traditional debates that we in our group have, have related? So these are questions that we were hoping to cover today with uh, a very great group of panelists. So, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll let the speakers mostly introduce themselves. I, I just say that we have Alexander Samur, who is um, an, an expert in questions related to technology and national security. So we heard uh, from, from Kurdi that she sees this uh, important role of technology standards for national security. So Alexander, both in her current role as a fellow uh, at the Center for New American Security, but also in the past role for US government uh, in the Department of Defense has very much focused on the importance of technology for national security. So I'm very much looking forward to her thoughts on that. We have on the my, uh, other right side, we have Gordon Gillerman, who, as we already have heard, is uh, the author of one of these uh, important pieces of standards policy that we do have in the United States. <laughs> so, very well branded, I must say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite impressed with it. <laughs> and um, so he's a uh, director of uh, standards coordination office. I hope I'm getting that right at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. So within that limited role that the United States uh, standardization system has for government, he is probably at, uh, at, at a very good position to oversee or uh, see many of the different forms of government involvement with standards, including at the international level, for example, through this new Trade and Technology Council, where uh, officials from the United States and uh, partners in Europe are trying to coordinate approach to standardization. Um, we also have Bo Hayden, who is uh, on top of being an academic, uh, who is uh, engaged in research, teaching, running conferences in both uh, the United States, Berkeley, and uh, Europe, and, and Sweden. He's also a policy expert on these issues, so we have uh, spent some time together on an expert group for the European Commission, where we debate the questions of standard essential. And we have George Contreras, who is a professor of law at the University of Utah, a uh, long-standing expert in the, in the field of uh, technology standards, and has also been uh, you know, involved more directly as a uh, counsel for standards organizations in that field and uh, has, has written very extensively on, on everything standards and so always a, always a good contributor to this debate. Um, with this, I think I'm going to take my seat so not to get the impression that I'm the one talking. And um, I, I'd like to open the panel maybe with Gordon. And uh, so, uh, given that you have uh, you have had this this uh, this role with U.S. government in, in, in various uh, capacities to uh, to uh, to define the, the engagement of U.S. government with uh, with a private standard system. Um, I, I'd like to hear you uh, and uh, and also in these uh, 
discussions with uh, international partners. I'd like to hear your, ta your take on these recent debates about the importance of leadership, US leadership in international standards. Um, what, 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 what do we uh, make out of it? Is, is, is that a notion that is appropriate? Should we care about whether the United States is a leader in international standards? And if we care about that the United States is, is a leader, what does it actually mean to be a leader in developing international standards? So Justice, first of all, thank you and the organizers for inviting me and thank my panelists here. Um, it's already been an interesting morning and I'm sure we'll have a, a quite an interesting uh, time as we go forward. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about why standards engagement, influence and leadership is important. What are we seeing in the standard system now? And what is NIST looking forward to do in the future? on standards. Um, so I come from a different planet than most of you. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I started my career at Underwriters Laboratories. Uh, I participated directly in the harmonization of IEC standards for computer products and electrical medical devices in the early days of US harmonization. Uh, the United States had its own standards. We had its own standard system, especially in safety, which was really important um, in the global trade environment. Uh, and this was the beginning of harmonization and not just harmonization in the standards, but in unifying the approach to demonstrating conformity for the global market. Um, so in doing this, we'd be able to create technical requirements and underlying testing and certification programs that would allow manufacturers one-stop shopping into a global marketplace, which is closer to where we are today than when I was young and doing it, but we was there at the very, very beginning of this, right? And so it was an interesting time. It was a tremendous evolution in the standards process. Um, at NIST, we are a National Metrology Institute. So if you pick your cell phone up or look at the clock on your uh, laptop, you're seeing work from NIST. Uh, the time signal comes from our Boulder, Colorado organization. Uh, so we do research in technology, measurement science. Uh, we provide services in measurement science and that time is one of them. Um, you also important you when you're doing your stock transactions to make sure they go through just at the right moment in time. Um, but we also have a tremendous role in using our knowledge and transferring that knowledge into documentary standards. Uh, across NIST, we have more than 400 staff members uh, who participate directly in the development of documentary standards. Uh, they do this in over 400 different standards organizations and 1,000 plus committee work. There is a tremendous rolling body of work. And one thing, and, and I, it's, it's interesting for me when we're in conferences that are SAP focused is if you look at the giant pie of standardization, the piece of that pie where SEPs are included is fractionally small, right? There are standards all around you right now in this room. Uh, if you pop open that little receptacle cover, there's a NEMA standard that defines the receptacle. There's underwriters laboratory standards that define the wiring to the receptacle and the connection to the main supply, right? The lighting system is covered by other kinds of standards as is the drop ceiling we have right here, right? All of this is standardized and it doesn't work without standards and we're not safe and secure without standards, mm -hmm. right? But SEPs are involved in a small fractional element very important fractional element in today's art marketplace, but a really small fractional element. So I just want to make sure in the context of it, we see what this big standards community looks like and what the output is. So I think Curti said it right, is standards set the stage for technology leadership, right? And before the leadership of China said it, the president of Sony said it, and the Department of Commerce leadership said it, right? If you set the rules of standards, you set the rules of technology and technology development. And it's really important. One of the interesting things that we're seeing is that standards are used by regulators and by the market. So we've seen the Europeans publish the AI Act, which is kind of the precipice for standards that are going to perhaps come forward and give us the ability to assess our confidence in trustworthy AI and then allow for some meaningful measurable regulation of AI. Uh, it's interesting, that's also talked about a lot. We are far away from that. Real standardization of the characteristics of the technology and the technology applications and the development process of AI has really not begun yet. We're struggling in the terminology definitions right now, right? But we're talking about AI as if it's something that's already here and already, it is here, but it really isn't here in that sense of being standardized and being able to assess yet. Mm -hmm. 
right? So I think Curtis said it well, standards is typically a 10 year journey in these new technology areas and we're at the onset of AI standardization. Mm -hmm. Standards are in the market and standards are used by regulators and they're both important aspects. And we've heard a lot of references today to the WTO technical barriers to trade and beyond that, an inference to the committee decision about the characteristics of standards development that lead to what's called international standards in the WTO TBT, which should be the first choice of regulators from member countries of the WTO, right? Important characteristics, but those don't constrain the marketplace. The marketplace gets to choose the standards it wants by the products that people buy and what they spend money on, right? So there's a dynamic in standards between those that are adopted in regulation and those that are used by the market and wanted by our society, right? And people tend to speak with their wallets on how all that works out. So it's really, really interesting. Um, we made a brief mention of OMB A119. So in the United States, before OMB A119, there was a law called the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act, a really, really long law. It has two paragraphs about standards. The basics are that the federal government shall participate in the development of voluntary consensus standard and use those in lieu of developing their own standards. So get out of the business of making specifications and participate in the community of making specifications through standards. Don't make a $400 toilet seat, use a regular toilet seat if it's possible, right? Those kind of easy decisions so we can be effective and efficient. It gives NIST a special role in coordinating conformity assessment and standardization across the federal government, my job, right? And so really that's the essence of that. Um, but none of the agencies understood what to do with it. So the publication of the Office of Management Budget, Circular A119, is a guidance to the federal agencies on the implementations of those two short paragraphs, two short but very important paragraphs across their agency enterprise, right? So if you read it, it's a lot longer now. Uh, it actually has a lot of focus on conformity assessment because that's my thing. Um, and I was a key author of the current version of that document and conformity assessment counts because the marketplace needs confidence, right? So these characteristics are all kind of bundled together. And it talks about how the government should look at participation and use of standards and participation and use of conformity assessment in its own work. So these are really important factors in my work. Um, as I said, coordination across the federal agencies is challenging. They have lots of dynamics. Uh, lots of the agencies have different levels of participation and different needs. So what do we see going on now? So again, you stole some of my thunder. So we like to count things, right? Because we love graphs and we love counting things. And you can count the number of people who come to a meeting and sit down. You can count leadership positions. You can count contributions. And all of that is interesting, but perhaps not the most important thing. What's really important is you can only get it with hindsight, is you look back and you see, which standards are published, what's the content of those standards, and which ones are actually adapted to, adopted, and used in the market and by regulators. And do those standards unduly favor a specific country, a specific policy, or a specific company? We're not going to know that for a while. And counting the number of people from any country who show up at a meeting is not the gateway to understanding the most important fact about standards. Right. So we like to count, we like to throw up statistics, and we like to make assumptions about what those things tell us. It's challenging. But what we're really seeing is right now, the standard system is a big filter, right? It filters the junk out and lets those contributions that develop the most fit for purpose technical documents move forward. And that seems to be what's still happening. I get that right, Kirti? So that's my way of saying the same thing you said, right? But it's changing, right? Participation is changing. We're seeing really, really dramatic changes in participation, particularly by China in international technology standards. So all these things have become really important. Some of the other things we're seeing is that standardization used to begin the development of document standards when the private sector could see commercialization on the horizon. Right When it started to see the money over, over the horizon, oh, we need to make a standard. Now what happens is at technology readiness level zero, you guys familiar with what TRLs are, right? So when you start doing research on a bright idea, it's TRL zero, 
right? It's an idea in somebody's head or maybe on a piece of paper. And as you move toward the market, you have several phases of this. We are seeing documentary standards move toward TRL zero, right? So it's happening early. And a lot of the real researchers who are really the smart people in these technologies think it's too early. And not only is it happening earlier, it's happening in multiple standards development organizations because they're camping out on new technologies because they want to be relevant. And if you look at what's happening in quantum, you can see it right now because quantum is now where AI was several years ago. Quantum's commercialization is still way over the horizon, but already we see standards development occurring in quantum. So now you have that same body of researchers who are really the people who know what's going on, not thinking it's ready for prime time and having to be scattered across lots of different standards development organizations to cover the waterfront of standards. Mm -hmm. So you see there's really a dynamic change happening in what's going on in standards. So standards also are important because standards themselves can be innovations. Um, so anybody who's on your laptop right now or maybe on your phone, you're using IEEE 802.11. Anybody know what that is? Wi-Fi, right? So Wi-Fi is not regulated. Wi-Fi is the marketplace speaking. You would not buy a cell phone or a laptop that doesn't Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi got us untethered from the phone cord, right, or the LAN cable. It was an innovation to be able to not be connected directly to the internet in some physical way and still have access. But then Wi-Fi itself became a platform for innovation over the past two decades like we've never seen. Um, I was sitting there uh, while Kurti was talking and my ring doorbell sent me a message and showed me a picture of my son's girlfriend showing up at our house. <laughs> <laughs> right? So who would have thought? <laughs> of course, he's back in Maryland where I live, you know, and I'm here, but he's 25 and she's 26, so it's all okay. <laughs> so, you know, what do we think is important going forward? So the most important thing, the thing that really influences standards is research and development. The best technology leads to the best contributions. It leads to the technically most fit for purpose standards that typically are chosen by the market, people speaking with their pockets, and chosen by regulators as the most fit for purpose for their regulatory needs. That is what we have seen historically in standards, and I believe it's what we'll see going forward. It may be more challenging to get to that end because there's so much stuff happening in standards that didn't happen before, but it seems like we're still headed in that direction. <laughs> One of the things that I'm very focused on is a standard savvy workforce for the future. There aren't a lot of people like me anymore, all right? I'm one of the younger people in the world of standards policy these days. We've been running a standards grant program for universities to bring standards education across the board to graduate and undergraduate universities. It's a small program. Uh, it's not really making a dent. And we were, in a meeting with the AEIPLA folks. And there was a presentation from a gentleman who was on the ground in China, and he gave us a presentation about what China is doing in standards education. That's a lot more worrisome to me than the number of people showing up at meetings and the number of contributions that I can count. So if I leave you with a few things, one of them is, we need to get standards back into the education system. I was an electrical engineer. I went to Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. I joined IEEE because it cost 10 bucks. I got a free t-shirt and I got to put on my resume. I never saw a standard to my first day in underwriters laboratories. I'm an electrical engineer. Electrical engineers must be able to use standards in their work. It's a part of their everyday life, but you don't learn it in school. You don't even learn what they are in regular curriculum. So if we are gonna have a standard savvy workforce of the future, not just STEM, STEM is important because they are the people who are gonna go and help write the standards, but who's making the resource allocation decisions? Lawyers, financial professionals who run technology companies. They also need to understand the inherent value of investing in those standards for the future. We also need to think about cooperation with like-minded countries. So I am the co-leader of both the US-EU Trade and Tech 
Technology Council Standards Working Group and the Quad Standards Working Group. I haven't been told what my role is going to be in the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum or the Prosperity for the Americas project that we just heard about, but it's likely to engage in standards as well. One of the things we've done is we have begun to create an international standards cooperation network with our like-minded partners, which is basically the bat phone for standards across central government coordination. So we're identifying people in central governments who have roles like mine to identify areas of cooperation or areas of concern in standardization as early in the process as possible and have a way to communicate with each other, to talk about the possibility of cooperation, reaching out to our private sectors and working together on standards. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, the next uh, speaker I'd like to hear from is Alexandra. So as I already mentioned, you're an expert in the areas of technology and national security. And um, we heard a lot about standards policy, but in Curtis' earlier talk, uh, we also heard about the intersection between standards and national security and how that might uh, affect our thinking about standards policy and uh, maybe even standards and intellectual property. So I, I'd like to invite you to offer some perspectives on that and, and your take on these recent debates. Yeah, absolutely. And first, oh, sorry, I'm a little short. <laughs> thank you, Justice, first of all, for, for moderating this panel. Thank you, Tim, Kurti, for your remarks in the beginning. This has been a great discussion so far. Um, and Gordon, thank you for, you laid out so many really great points. Um, some of the things that I was also going to hit on as well. Um, but first and foremost, I wanted to start by just talking about what it means when you're thinking about technology and national security. I think the important thing is to recognize from the US perspective what it means for us when we are thinking about national security. For us, we view it through the lens of strategic competition. You've probably heard over and over. And for us, the heart of strategic competition really is values. How do we want the world to look? Um, for the US, it's uh, promoting with like-minded allies and partners, a free and open international system. Um, and key to that, as we have seen, is the technology competition. Um, because so much is centered around it, technology is evolving rapidly across the board, regardless of what type of technology you're looking at. Um, and, and we've seen even with the government and um, and organizations trying to keep up. It's incredible the amount of innovation and how quickly it happens, seeing how much the private sector is able to do uh, and how much has shifted over to Silicon Valley and spread across the, uh, the, the country as well uh, as places have established hubs elsewhere. Um, but it really is becoming an awakening moment I think just watching how quickly everything responds and how, how the government can respond to to make sure that we're keeping up. Standards really do underpin the way that we are thinking about technology in terms of use, in terms of development. Um, I think that uh, you touched upon that as well, Gordon. Um, so it is important for us to be involved in these conversations because ultimately, if we're not involved in the standard setting conversations, um, it's going, the way that technology is developed and is used is going to be contrary to, to the vision that we have. And we're going to see illiberal uses emerge as we have seen. We've seen um, you know, surveillance states prop up. Um, there's tons of questions about data privacy and security. Um, and we're seeing even within the United States, those discussions are, are different on the state level. We're seeing federal legislation put forward now to try to figure out a unified effort. Um, so it, it really is wide ranging in that respect. Um, and we want to make sure that we're preserving those core democratic values. And we are working with our allies and partners because there's no way that we're going to be able to implement these if we do not. Um, and, and, it's, and it is critical to our security in that way. Um, but I want to come back to one thing that Gordon had mentioned, because I was going to mention it as well, um, is that sometimes it is really difficult to develop these standards just because of how quickly the technology is developing. Um, prior to this role, I had worked for an AI startup um, and so was actually involved in some of those conversations that NIST had hosted to try and put together a risk management framework. And some of the things, it, it's really difficult because so much is still in the qualitative space where we're trying to answer questions about how do we measure bias? How do we measure fairness? How do we measure transparency? Um, I, I think we see a lot of these with brand licensing as well and just trying to find those concrete metrics that we're able to, to implement. Um, and so I think that there's also 
an element of us needing to recognize that that things are going to change and we need to let technology progress um, because it, it, it's hard to try and quantify them right at this point, um, uh, especially for, for things that are so qualitative in nature. Um, so I think this also is going to require um, for US both technology technology leadership and economic power, we're going to have to work closely with uh, the private sector um, because they are leading in the space. And um, uh, from a national security standpoint, uh, ju just in sum for, for the beginning, uh, Come, coming back to a lot of what Kirti said as well, um, you know, pointing to 5G and AI and all of the different technologies and the ways that we're trying to think about standards. Um, they're going to govern the way, as these technologies become more incorporated into our lives um, and become central, uh, they're going to impact the, the way that we, you know, we, we perform as a society and the way that we interact with each other. Um, and so it is uh, both for from a societal standpoint and for our national security interests as we're we're seeing and influence um we're going to need to continue uh, to work together and make sure we're involved thank you very much alexandra um i next wanted to hear from bo and as i mentioned that we were both involved in this expert group on standard essential patents and I remember that you could always be counted upon to pull the debate to the higher level and said, okay, let's focus on the big picture. And one of the big pictures that you were particularly uh, concerned about is um, implications of fairly technical and sometimes esoteric uh, standardization policy debates for notions such as the ability of Western countries to lead in the development of international standards. So am I getting that right or remembering that right? And if so, then why, why, why do you... Think that this is important. What is uh, what is it for you that it's, it's important about this notion of leading in international standards? Yeah, I think that's a nice way of saying I annoyed people with this. Right? <laughs> okay. So uh, so thanks to Justice and to Tim and Kirti for inviting me here. It's great to be in Chicago. I, I lived here when I was three and twenty three. I don't remember much from the first time, but the second time Michael Jordan was here, so that was a good time. <laughs> and. Um, I'm going to give a few thoughts on this, on leadership, because I think it's a little tricky issue, as was discussed before. I also have another goal with this session, is that I think that the chair I'm sitting on is, is weight limited exactly at the weight that I am right now. So I'm hoping to maintain the structural integrity of this chair during this talk as well. All right. I shouldn't have had that stake last night, Lou. All right. So... Uh, Leadership, it's an interesting discussion. So let me just start out by saying, you know, there's an, I think we can all agree that there's a numerous standards that are critical to supporting key infrastructure that underpins a digital society, right? Um, and which by its very nature, because it underpins the digital society is strategic areas that affects economic competitiveness and, and national security. Mm -hmm. So I think it's difficult to dispute that, right? We'll see if we can do that today. Um, but there's going to be different definitions of leadership, right? Um, depending on the nature of the standard. For example, I work with looking into the issues of how we're going to build the new SWIFT standard or transaction standard, the crypto SWIFT. That has obviously very big implications, but it's different than, say, creating um, you know, connectivity standards. They're both strategic, so in different ways they act differently. So what? So what would be the meaning of leadership? Let's so say we take cellular, for example, for open consensus-based standardization ecosystem. What do we call it? And I think Carol mentioned a bit, like when we say, what are the rules? What are we talking about? And I had I had two ideas of openness before, and then Jim gave me a third. So I had three I had levels here, but then I knew Jim was gonna add another one. So I had another one before and I preempted him. So now I have four levels now to think about this on, because I think we have to break it down into the different to understand it. And um, first one is the SDO leadership. How do we want to lead within the SDO? What should that mean? And I'll talk about a little bit of that more in, in the end here. Then there's a technology patent leadership. That's another level. Where do we want to lead there? That's important as well. What about product market leadership? Should we lead there? Should we be leading in the sale of, of physical products, mobile phones, you know, and eventually autonomous cars? Should we lead on that level? Or is it the service market leadership? Should we have the 5G rolled out across the country in the United States? much faster and much better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. These are all different levels of, of leadership that are all intertwined, but they're, they, they're governed differently and they mean different things. So I think as we go through to talk about this, we can talk about these different levels. But just talk about the last one quickly um, before I end this now. 
the SDO leadership, and I, this is, I'm going to echo a bit what you said, Alexandra. So standards are technical norms, right? I'm going to talk about norms. They're basically technology norms that we put together into, into a technical standard. So they're implicitly and explicitly embedded with values. So when you create technical norms, you're going to embed your social norms into them, whether you know it or not, right? So um, given the importance in providing the infrastructure, as I just mentioned in the digital economy, it's important for these SDO activities that they're governed under liberal democratic norms, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so participation can be open, but governance needs to be led by liberal democratic norms. And I think we, we have to draw the line there and we have to mm -hmm. be strong on those issues. And that's definitely the key leadership on that level. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Justice. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bo. So our last panelist is George. And George is uh, an extremely prolific writer and has uh, written on almost any possible standardization related question that you could think of. And so it's not a surprise that he has also started writing about these questions that we are debating today and uh so uh first of all team of people in the basement I think. oh no, i did not know that <laughs> so first I, I i'd like to ask you the general question basically what is what is your general take on this on this notion on this emerging notion of standards leadership whether it's in your view an accurate perception that there is a geopolitical competition for leadership whether u.s leadership is being challenged and whether that is something that we should do something about and then the other is that um this uh article of yours that you have shared with me where you're basically uh taking the position that there is um that there is a confusion or that there's an improper uh uh, relation that is being drawn between between the notion of national security and and uh, uh, standards policy debates in particular with respect to standards essential patents. So I'd like to hear uh, your, your your views on both these. Things. Yeah, thank thank you very much, Yusuf, and and thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this panel and this this conference. Um, no, I th I think it's absolutely true that there is international competition in this area, um, an area that on the technical side has traditionally been characterized by international cooperation and collaboration, right? We have global standards because engineers, and I'm an electrical engineer as well, uh, engineers got together from all over the world then helped to create these. And that's why these standards are used all over the world. We've seen historically the standards that are developed by one country um, exclusively by people from that country do not become very popular. Um, elsewhere in the world, right? And that was a lesson that China learned um, early on. Um, and one of the reasons I believe that it has come into the international standardization community, because that's where the standards are the most effective. So U.S. leadership in this area um, is an interesting question. And obviously, U.S. technology companies have been leaders in many market segments over the years. Um, and this has been beneficial to the United States economy. Um, without a doubt. And as a matter of economic policy and industrial policy, the U.S. government uh, and all governments promote uh, the leadership of their own domestic companies uh, within the bounds of international treaty obligations. And that's perfectly appropriate. We have tax incentives, R&D uh, initiatives, uh, student loans, STEM education, any range of government policies that are intended to help international um, or to help national uh, uh, producers uh, improve their productivity and their stature around the world. And I think that's all entirely appropriate. And I think the U.S. has done a very good job of this um, over the last half century. What, what the article that you mentioned um, is about, though, is, is trying to disentangle this question of economic and industrial policy from national security and basically defense policy. And it sets out to debunk this idea that uh, the development of standards like the 5G or the Wi-Fi standards are actually matters of national security. Uh, because when those arguments of national security are raised in this context, they're being used to support protectionist policies um, that are intended to favor not the entire U.S. economy, but a handful of U.S. businesses. Um, and that seems to be different 
than the type of overall economic and industrial policy that is the most helpful. Okay, so so why are these standards not matters of national security? And national security meaning defense, military, as opposed to economic welfare. Well, and at root, they're consumer product standards. They're standards for products that will be sold around the world in global markets. Like, yes, they do contribute to the national security infrastructure, as, as we've heard earlier, but so does almost every other technology that we know about. The internet, radar, radio, materials like steel and rubber and plastic, all of these have military and defense applications. Um, but we generally allow those markets to operate commercially and don't link uh, their health um, or their support to national security. Uh, so clearly there are national security issues around the supply of interconnected devices, both uh, in military theaters, but also within the nation overall. But the thing about standards, as we've heard earlier this morning, is that they are in fact open. Um, and, and I do truly believe that standards in the way we're speaking about them today are open. Anybody can make a product uh, that conforms to the standards. So they're not secret military technologies. We do have secret military technologies, and those need to be protected and classified, and they are. But these consumer product standards are not that. So there are concerns that foreign governments could influence the way that these standards develop, um, which is entirely possible in an open standardization setting. People from different governments can be part of the standardization process and try to influence the direction of the standard. And in fact, we have seen that happen. And as the outside counsel for uh, the IETF for 20 years, I saw this happen. And believe me, it was mostly the US government um, that tried to influence the direction of standards in ways relating to surveillance um, and backdoors uh, into the internet uh, through government means. And all of those efforts were resisted by the developers of the standards. And uh, for those reasons, I think we do have a more secure um, and a more private internet experience than we might otherwise have had. Um, that can happen again, no matter what the country is. So there are also concerns about patents, and I will get to patents later. Um, but patents, uh, despite the disputes that we have over patents, and I am certainly um, no fan of these disputes, uh, there are commitments that patent holders make to make their patented technology available to anyone who implements the standard. What the price of that is, we have some debates over. Uh, but at the end of the day, these FRAND and royalty-free commitments enable anyone who wants to, to make a standardized product. And even if a patent holder decided to renege on that obligation, um, at least in the United States, uh, we have a wonderful statute called 28 USC 1498 that allows the government and government contractors to use any patented technology without the permission of the owner um, for a governmental purpose. So if we're talking about national security, um, defense and military applications, the government always has the right to use this technologies upon the payment of an amount that's determined um, in the US Court of Claims. So there's not a supply risk um, when we're talking about these standards. Um, and then in terms of the domestic industry and industry leadership, as we've heard already, standards like 5G are already international standards. And no matter how you want to measure it, whether it's numbers of patents, numbers of contributions, number of publications that come out, um, by any of these metrics, um, one thing is sure, and that is that there is no single country that is leading uh, in this area. There are pretty equal distributions of entities from China, Korea, Japan, the European Union, and the US, who are all leaders in this area. Um, so it's not a race that is going to be lost. This is already an international collaborative area, as it should be. And so I would join others in saying that the emphasis here ought to be on international cooperation and not on some attempt to seize leadership uh, in this area where, where we already don't have it. Excellent. So um, we are um, a little bit behind schedule in terms of the outline of the session that we had planned. So I, I, I suggest that I give each uh, speaker one uh, more opportunity to speak, but maybe in the interest of having uh, time for Q&A, uh, maybe we keep the answers a bit shorter. And um, perhaps the, the first speaker I'd like to um, 
uh, here, here again from Ms. Alexandra, because we, we had these different notions of national security being brought up. Like it's, we have what I would call a narrower interpretation of the word where it's basically focusing on a specific military technology or uh, access of, uh, for, for the government to uh, military use of privately developed standards. And then we have like these broader and broader notions of values uh, being uh, mm -hmm. included into uh, built into the system or reflected in the governance of these private organizations. So I, I'd like to hear, first of all, like it's um, where you would draw the line and what is mm -hmm. the appropriate uh, uh, definition of national security uh, and where protectionism for purely commercial interests uh, begins and then what are examples of specific appropriate uh, roles for a U.S. government in its defense and its custodian the role as custodian of the national security of the United States to take in this in the space which mm -hmm. is historically dominated by private organizations. Sure, absolutely. So I think first, I, I'd like to push back a bit where I think it's really difficult to try and completely divorce the national security interest just from the pure economic interest, because you know, these days, you probably have often heard the saying too, that economic security is national security. We're seeing those very closely interlinked. And you can even see that within the defense apparatus too, where we're dealing with a lot of dual use technologies. Even the military wants to acquire, you know, commercial off the shelf technologies that they can quickly try and to bring into systems and, uh, uh, and try to accelerate into the broader apparatus. So I, I think there's concerns there too, with understanding where those business practices are and what that could mean for national security, even though there is the economic aspect there as well for um, for, co for company interest and in how they're building out their business model, both in the commercial sector and in the national security space. Um, so that's number one. I think um, just the broader supply chain issues writ large, I mean, those do pertain to the, the defense apparatus, but those are, are wide sweeping as well. Um, I, I think we see a lot with semiconductors, which are used in multiple technologies. You have them in your fridges, you have them uh, in your computers that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but you also use them for other critical technologies. And so that also has also wide sweeping implications too, if we're not able to acquire those and to use them uh, in these various technologies. And I know there's been a big push for us to try and bring a lot of those capabilities back home, which I think is right. Um, and the same as, as working with allies and partners uh, for, from that end. Um, I, I think that another thing that we need to think about, and this goes beyond military, is just, um, and I think it is something that Kirti was talking about beforehand about how we can't be uh, sidestepping any of the standards that we do set and really upholding the governance principles that we create is just the issue of IP theft that we're seeing as well. Um, and I think that also is from an economic interest for, for companies because if the IP is being taken, um, they're not able to, First of all, it's going to erode our own technological advantage if other countries are, are taking IP and are using it for their own games, um, as opposed to contributing it to the broader system that we're trying to create. Um, but then it also is a disincentive for the companies, too, if they're seeing the hard work and the investments uh, that they've been making being being taken um, in a way that is unfair. Um, so there is there's that component, too, of making sure that we're um, protecting the companies that are making the investments and, and those strong standards are in place so that they're encouraged to continue investing and maturing the technology and doing it in a way that is democratic um, through the organizations that we set. Um, so I do think it, for some of those reasons, it does, it, from my perspective, make it difficult to fully divorce the two. Um, and then I, I forget the second part of your question, mm -hmm. if you don't mind reminding me. <laughs> I think you you covered uh, most of the most of, most of the topic that I had, and I, I think we we should allow a little bit of time for sure. for the for the for the audience too. So I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll kick, kick the ball to to our next speaker. Sure, and I will conclude there and pass the baton. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I also wanted to um, uh, hear again from Gordon, and in particular uh, with respect to this articulation of what the government does and what industry does in this space. So we we heard that you are uh, the author behind uh, the uh, OMB Circular A one hundred nineteen, which is primarily about 
how US government agencies participate in the private standards bodies and the use that government agencies can make of the standards developed by these private industry bodies. But there's more recent at least discussion or studies or thoughts about uh, whether there's uh, a more active role that government may take in promoting issues such as in its leadership, uh, uh, strategic national interests in, in, in international standards, and whether that may translate into involvement in SDO governance or in, in standards development more directly. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, you, you, you could comment on whether you think that the articulation between the role of government and and the, and the private sector is evolving. Whether there's a, a shift in that, that that maybe you can observe internationally, and whether you you think that something of that sort is uh, is is likely to to be seen also in the U.S. coming going forward. So I'll go back to the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act. Really sets the tone. We in the United States have a private sector led standard system. Um, I believe we're going to. Stay with that. Um, we think that that private sector led standard system has done wonders for our capabilities. Um, one of the things that's very interesting, um, and I'll just draw a comparison, something we were talking about before to what happens in the European Union, where their standardization system really is seemingly well more organized on an org chart, but their regulators are really almost required to use standards that are published by SEN, Senelec, and Etsy as EN, European norms. Uh, these are the only standards that can be published and referenced in the official journal of the European communities is providing a presumption of conformity to the new approach directives. Those are the directives for everything that has a CE marking associated with it, which is a huge portion of the products used in that big internal market. But it also means that they don't get a lot of choice, right? In the United States, our regulators can participate in lots of different variety of standards development activities, and they can choose once those standards are published for the ones that are most fit for purpose, and they can adopt them in whole or in part or as modified as they see fit. So our ability to participate in a much more diverse portfolio of standardization, right? And then our ability to choose the best fit for purpose, both from the technical soundness of the standards, as well as the development methodology, gives us a tremendous advantage, I think, in the way that we use standards in a regulatory and a procurement and a programmatic sense within the government. I think the answer to your other question, just to be short, is our job in government is to create an environment that's conducive to participation, engagement, and influence in international standards for U.S. companies. Excellent. Thank you. And we promised that we would uh, set the floor for more IP related debates and we haven't talked that much about standard essential patents so far. So I'd uh, uh, like to give that a heavy duty to, to Bo to, to basically uh, um, think, uh, walk us through what, what you, where you see um, the, the, the concrete uh, intersection between SEP debates and these broader debates about technology leadership, standards leadership. The, the governance of the global standardization system, um, because that's, after all, the context in which uh, in which we met, basically, and, and right. you you brought up these thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So just quickly, now that we're short on time, so I think if we draw a diagram, we would again, uh, we would all agree that technology leadership is the key to everything nowadays. Whoever wins in the technology innovation in the next industrial revolution is going to control everything going to control the economic competitiveness, national defense, and economic and national defense is, is together part of national security. So when I listen to George, I get a little bit of a more narrow that this is just an input to um, doing something on the national defense <laughs> side instead of the bigger picture. But I do understand that the nature of uh, how we do standards and open consensus is different than if we were just doing something in a laboratory mm -hmm. in defense lab in the United States. Um, this also relates back to these categories that I made before, because we can talk about the SDO leadership as a different level and technology leadership is key. And that can be open in, in different ways that, for example, nowadays we don't buy Huawei infrastructure in the United States, right? So that's closed off on the product level, but they still participate, still have patents in the United States and they still participate on the SDO. You know, I mean, we don't say that, well, what, what carrier do you have? And oh, I have at and oh, I have Verizon. Well, I have China Telecom. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon in the United States either. So there are different levels on these different uh, uh, different areas. 
So, what, but when it comes to the IPR policy debate, maybe I can talk a little bit about the, the recent statement that was rescinded, which is interesting. Um, I think the policy has to be do no harm, right? Mm -hmm. We have to start out, and it's very complicated, so it's very easy to do harm without knowing about it. So I, I believe, as Justice and I spoke about before, that governments should be there to help provide information. It should be more evidence-based. So one of my recommendations um, in the uh, to the DOJ in the recent uh, comments was, why are you putting out this, this letter all the time if you're going to change it every time there's a new political regime? If it only changes because of who's politically in power, it's not useful. If it changes because of evidence, then it's useful, right? So what governance can do, governments can do is produce evidence that could then, if we produce evidence-based documents, then I'm happy for any government organization to produce an evidence-based document. But I don't think we need political-based documents because that goes back to Kirti's first issue that stopped the posturing, right? Uh, so again, do no harm. I also think that the antitrust issue I had hoped that that would solve to some extent that SCPs were more contract and patent based, but uh, I think there's a number of policymakers in the government that don't seem to understand that the patent system supports innovation, not blocking innovation. They equate patents with monopoly and monopoly is the same category as big actors and it's bad, but it's completely different in different contexts. Um, so, so for me, in the end of the day, patents, if we talk a little bit about patents again, patents are essential excuse the pun, uh, to producing high performance standards. You have to have them. In other words, um, they're not blocking, they're building blocks. Without the patents, you wouldn't be, the, the patents are bringing the standard into existence. So we wouldn't have the quality standard we have without the use of patents in this context. So there's no use to argue about whether the, the thing that was created that's great is patented because it wouldn't be here at all without that. It's the same for drugs. So this rather simple but somewhat non-intuitive statement has to be understood by policymakers if we can just take this step forward and find agreement and move forward evidence-based instead of political. Thanks. Thank you. Well, my last question for the speakers before opening up to the audience is to George again. So um, part of these, what some people at least perceive to be increasing uh, geopolitical notion of these debates, including competition between different economic systems, between different uh, countries in this space, is what you might call or perceive to be a competition to set rules for IPR in this space. So at least in the European Commission, I think that there's a keen awareness that, okay, we are uh, we are trying to set rules in order not to follow the rules set by others. And, and part of that, one important uh, salient uh, uh, aspect of that that you have written extensively about is this uh, what you could call a, a race to the courts in different places uh, definitely a race by different stakeholders to bring debates to different uh, venues that they perceive to be more convenient but also maybe uh, at least by some courts to position themselves as an attractive venue for, for self litigation so um that is uh, something that you have written on, but it's also something that has drawn policy interest that this might be something where we need to protect the interests of uh, U.S. stakeholders and the interests of uh, the U.S. judicial system to, uh, to uh, and its ability to resolve uh, disputes related to American patents within the U.S. So I, 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 I was wondering whether you could comment on this. Yeah, Justice, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the bigger problems that we see in the world of uh, standards policy is this issue that's emerged uh, where courts in one country have taken it upon themselves to set the global rates uh, for patents in many different countries um, for, that are standards essential. And this has created this strange uh, international competition among jurisdictions. Parties are clearly racing to the courthouse in the jurisdiction that they think is going to be most favorable to them, leading to various inter-jurisdictional uh, orders like anti-suit injunctions, anti-anti-suit injunctions that we've heard uh, entire conferences uh, focus on. And, and this is not productive. And it's um, become not just an issue of commercial competition, but a diplomatic issue, right, where the uh, European Union uh, has filed a complaint in the World Trade Organization against China, um, a complaint now joined by the U.S., Japan, and Canada. Uh, so this has risen to an international diplomatic and trade uh, set of issues. And here, 
I think that uh, we see very well uh, countries are trying to promote national interests through their legal systems, in this case, the judicial systems, as opposed to antitrust enforcement or uh, legislation. But this is an area where I, I do think that the U.S. can take some leadership um, and try to help solve this problem uh, through legislation, not through the enforcement agencies, um, but legislation that is intended to limit the effect of these foreign uh, global friend orders on U.S. patents. And this is entirely possible within the scope of legislation. And uh, legislation has been proposed in various committees in the U.S. Senate and House uh, relating to different ways that you could do this, right? I mean, one piece of legislation would potentially penalize parties who seek to enforce foreign anti-suit injunctions in U.S. patent cases, uh, create some presumptions against those parties, strip them of the right to challenge patents at the Patent Trial and Appeals Board. That, that legislation has gotten some press and some attention. I don't think is as effective as other legislation that's been proposed. There's something called the Standard Essential Royalty Act, which would take an even more aggressive stance and would basically uh, say that with respect to U.S. patents, um, royalties uh, established under FRAND policies could not be set by a, a foreign court. Um, those wouldn't be recognized if challenged in the U.S. In fact, you would need some sort of U.S. body to adjudicate rates for U.S. patents. Um, so this would do, this type of legislation would do a few things, and it's counterintuitive. And first, it would break up that race to the courthouse. If you already have a major country like the U.S. that is not going to recognize the rates set by a foreign court. There's less incentive to race to the foreign court. It's also very predictable that as soon as the U.S. does this, other countries will follow suit. And so you'll have many countries that say we're not going to recognize these globally set rates, say, by a court in the United Kingdom um, or China. Those are the two countries that have been most active in the global rate setting. Okay, so why is that a good thing? It seems like that makes things less efficient, uh, because then instead of having a single court in the UK setting these rates, you have courts in 10 different countries setting the rates so from the 10 largest uh, markets in this area. And that might be the immediate outcome, but it's not necessarily the end point, right? So this national rate setting could be set up so that it addresses not just the dispute between two parties, right, one patent holder and one implementer, but all of the patents covering a particular standard so that you could consolidate all of these in an action that we have today in the U.S. called interpleader. Um, it allows multiple claims holders uh, to be brought into court together to settle a number of claims together relating to one um, to one dispute. Um, so you could involve all the patent holders and all of the implementers relating to a particular standard in the same statutorily required uh, rate setting procedure. It sounds like a big and complicated procedure, and it would be, but A, we already do this in the copyright area with equally complex uh, sets of facts, numbers of parties, and so forth, um, with uh, you know cable retransmission of televised rates with the uh, uh, compulsory mechanical license. So it's done already, um, and it works pretty well. Um, and um, once you start this sort of thing, you may get other countries that decide to join in to this type of procedure um, with the ultimate goal, uh, I think, and which I've written about for a long time, that you, there really ought to be a single international tribunal, arbitral or governmental, to set rates for particular standards, um, sort of like you have uh, single rates for patent pools, um, this isn't happening voluntarily in the standards world for a number of reasons, uh, but a nudge from a government like the U.S. government breaking up the ability of international or foreign courts to set these global rates could push us in that direction um, with this intermediate step of individual countries doing it. So it, uh, it may sound somewhat far-fetched, but, but there are actual proposals floating around committees um, in the Senate right now that uh, start to move in this direction. And I think this would be an excellent place for the US to take some leadership um, and uh, try to make this system a little bit more efficient. 
Thank you, George. And with uh, that, I uh, would like to open the floor to the audience, uh, questions, comments, to all these diverse thoughts and that we have heard. Okay, I'll let Derek manage the queue. <laughs> uh, hi, Andy Gray from Vectus IP. Um, I was interested, Gordon, when you mentioned that the, you know, the market was an, a filter, I guess, for which standards win out ultimately. What are your thoughts on the EU Parliament in the last week or so uh, forcing or ruling that all wireless charging um, for smartphones and tablets and, and such should be USB-C based by 2024? Do you think that's that kind of intervention is something we're going to see more of? So I don't know the answer if we're going to see more of it. Um, and it's really not in the purview of the National Institute of Standards and Technology on those issues. Uh, it is an interesting issue, although I might prognosticate that there might be similar discussions as we move toward electric vehicle charging in mass. Um, so it is something to watch and something that's very, very interesting. Um, you know, I, I think in many ways, there are some legitimate discussions about waste and sustainability that come into this as well, right? And I think that some of what the EU has done um, is justified by talking about the fact that, you know, every time you get a cell phone, do you really need a new wall wart and a new cable? And, you know, what happens to all these products at the end of their lives? There may be other ways to look at this. Um, I do think that as we move forward, and really begin to understand the effect of not just technology, but everything we do uh, on the climate moving forward. Um, what has historically been done in life cycle assessment, I don't know how familiar the audience is, uh, but this is really looking at the environmental trade-offs that are made on particularly in products between what materials they use to make them, how they're made, where they're made, how they're transported, and what their end of life and use characteristics are and how does that contribute to positively or negatively or, or nil to the environment, um, <clears throat> we need more science in this. Um, we really need to have a better scientific underpinning for those characteristics that we measure for these different factors that we allow to be used in the trade-offs in these discussions of life cycle assessment. Um, and, and this really you know, is part of that. Uh, but I think right now the underpinning science um, for all of the characteristics that we have to look at uh, has a level of uncertainty that probably isn't letting us make good decisions right now. Uh, so this is a question. So Gordon brought up a point about uh, standardization. So it seems to me uh, when I think of old standards like RCA cables, right? So, so those, I think we're missing an aspect that a pr proprietary standard can eventually become a de facto standard and an open standard to everybody. So with that, it makes me, uh, we talk about people having an unfair advantage, right? But, you know, um, isn't there a role to risk and reward investment, right? If, if a company wants to have, say, Firewire or whatever, right? If the market's ultimately going to choose and we're talking about more and more regulation, setting how much return on investment you can get through fran rates. Are we moving to a place, especially for example, a company like Apple who's sitting on a surplus of cash where everyone would benefit by them developing proprietary standards with the idea that if it is the best technology, it, it will eventually win, right? Um, so, so I think it's, a, you know, we're talking about completely proprietary standard body organization, but there is another path to become a standard, right? Proprietary that becomes open through expiration of IP rights. So I just wanted to think if Gordon had any comments about that through, you know, most of these electrical cables, right? They were GE developed and proprietary at one point in time, right? Predates my time. Although the interesting part of the discussion is uh, hi-fi is my hobby, but I don't know the answer to the question. Maybe just one or two more so we can get our break. Okay, one or two more. I, I have a two-part question because the, the answer to the first might obviate the need for the second, but but it'll be short. And then my, my question is, is to your 
Do you put um, a court evaluating whether an offer is friend, if that offer is multi-jurisdictional, in the same category as a court deciding on its own basis, whatever multi-jurisdictional terms are for friend? I mean, I, th I think you would have to, otherwise, like obviously everybody would phrase their dispute in terms of uh, the first the first one, right? And so so are, so are you saying that a multi-jurisdictional offer should be per se non-friend? And if so, if you are saying that, how do you square that with the many, many decisions we've already seen finding worldwide licenses or multi-jurisdictional licenses compliant with friend? So I don't... I, I don't quite see the presumption that, that you you mentioned. I mean, clearly there are going to be plenty of multi-jurisdictional licenses that are perfectly friend um, when parties agree, right? So the question is when they disagree um, and they have to adjudicate whether or not an offer was friend or not. At that point, under these statutory proposals, at that point for U.S. patents, you would have to go to this U.S. procedure as opposed to getting that question adjudicated outside. I will just comment that that's basically substituting a unreal definition of brand at the adjudication dispute stage for the real world, what parties actually agree to uh, when they made brand commitments. I just, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but I, I look forward to exploring it more. Uh, one more over here, then we're going to break. <laughs> Um, good morning, <clears throat> Eva Hakuranta. Oh, yeah, sorry, my voice is <clears throat> really, really sort of cracking today. Uh, just a comment. I think you know there's a real danger in in George your your proposal because we've just only just sort of started come to come to the. Sorry, could, could you talk real... about? It? I can't really hear about it. it it's on. Ah, okay. um, not better now. That's okay. Better. okay. So I, I just want to comment that there's a real danger in what you're proposing because we've just started having portfolio determinations. And you know, we've all agreed that we can't do patent by patent, country by country. So what I see your proposal doing is, you know, putting us squarely back into patent by patent, country by country. And if we take a bigger, a broader picture, we would see the Fran agreement as a social contract where people contributed and now they need to be compensated. And that should, by the general nature of it, it should be handled on a worldwide basis, on a portfolio basis, and on a timely basis in order to fulfill the, the, the quid pro quo agreement from the beginning. It would seem to be ra rational. I think it's coffee time. Yeah. Okay. We well, then, uh, <laughs> please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for our discussion. Uh,